So everybody, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending. My name is James Mathias. I am head of product for PainCheck's Adult Tool. I'm here with our CEO, Philip Daffis, who's down out front. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about PainCheck, specifically around our use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in that clinical environment. Obviously, with the name PainCheck, this relates to pain assessment. So to get us started all, pain is, well, it's hard to assess. Where you, where you have someone who is unable to reliably self-report their pain, or unable to effectively communicate, potentially someone living with dementia, disability, brain injury, various other conditions, or at the other end of the spectrum, a pre-verbal infant, a child who's yet to learn how to reliably report their pain, pain assessment is incredibly hard. There are a variety of observational tools that have been used for many years. Often these are paper-based, these are highly subjective, and these are very reliant on what can be variable observations by a clinician or an assessor. And for these reasons, they're often significantly underused. And then, of course, we've developed the PainCheck application, a certified medical device for the assessment of pain, which many people, including some of the, uh, the founders of those, pain, those observational pain scales that have been in use for some time, have described as an evolution in pain assessment, taking advantage of modern technology. And some of those observational tools have been around for 20 plus years, and a lot has changed in 20 plus years, allowing us to significantly improve that pain assessment practice. Importantly, uh, amongst those, uh, I guess, changes is also the concept of point of care assessment. When assessment takes place away from a patient in a nurse's station or off the floor, the issues of subjectivity that I've noted only become more pronounced. And with the PainCheck app, that medical device in the form of an application, we're able to see significant benefit. So I've talked a lot about you know, conceptually their observational pain assessment, but I want to drill down. The, the core and the title of this presentation talks about our use of artificial intelligence, and that is one component of the pain check assessment. So pain check was originally developed out of a place called Curtin University over in Western Australia. Um, I like to joke while I've been in North America that you've definitely heard of Australia, you've possibly heard of Western Australia and the city of Perth, you've probably not heard of Curtin University, however it is one of the major universities in Australia. Um, so all of our founders came out of Curtin University, they were all working in the School of Pharmacy there, and they identified that where pain was being assessed in a clinical setting, for those you know, reasons that I've highlighted earlier, pain was often being very poorly quantified. If pain was under-identified, it could lead to under-treatment, people simply living in pain. It could lead to inappropriate treatment, the use of things like antipsychotic medications or tranquilizing medications, which have huge negative ramifications for that individual. You're treating a symptom, you're not treating an underlying cause. And of course, we could see over over-treatment, over-identification, things like inappropriate use of opioid medication, which, as we all know, has, again, really significant Im potential impacts. So being researchers, they went and did the research. Several proje research projects and peer-reviewed published papers later, they came up with what would become the core of the pain check solution. As you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, well, one of those core parts of the solution is the concept of facial analysis. Facial analysis has often been used in the past as part of the pain assessment process, but it has been manual, it has been subjective. It is challenging, it is easy to get wrong. So they looked at, you know, how can we improve this? I want to introduce you all to the concept of the facial action coding system. This is a variety, uh, it's effectively a catalog of all the different things that a human face can do. Um, it's been developed over you know, an extended period of time. It's ori originally published back in 1978, which I, I've realized that some of the core research underpinning our tech is the exact same age as InterSystem. So that was a fun, fun little note. But in the, the facial action coding system looks at all the different things a human face can do, originally developed by an American researcher, a ge gentleman named Professor Paul Ekman. So Professor Ekman was working, I believe it was Papua New Guinea, with local indigenous people. And he sort of identified that, wait a minute, when I'm feeling happy, I've got a big smile on my face. And when you're feeling happy, you've got a big smile on your face. When I'm disgusted, I, I've got a disgust expression, and, and you happen to have the same one. So how, how is that? We're totally separate populations. We don't share a culture. We don't share a language. 
What's the go? So that was the, the, uh, the, I guess, the origination of this research. So from there, it's progressed over the past 45 years. And I'm so glad there was a big sandcastle with 45. I don't have to do, those, do that maths. But over the past 45 years, it's continued to be developed. And what we've identified are that the, is that there are certain facial micro-expressions, combinations of muscle movements, which are indicative of pain in humans, cross-culturally. So some of those, nine of those, or not quite all nine on this lovely gentleman's face, are is sort of visible to us. So things like wrinkling your nose or raising your cheeks. With that window into someone's pain experience, we could then begin developing a system to automatically look at the face using the modern technology we now have and identify whether those microexpressions are present or absent at the time of assessment. We took the hardest part of the pain assessment process and we made it easy, we made it automatic, and we made it totally consistent, no matter who is conducting the pain assessment. The face isn't the entire assessment tool, though. It is a multi-dimensional assessment, as any modern clinical assessment needs to be. So we look at six different domains, things like vocalizations, the person's movement, their activity, the condition of their body, and you'll see more of this in just a second. But ultimately, we've taken what was a manual, slow, inconsistent process. We've used artificial intelligence based on a machine learning model. We've automated significant proportions of it to result in a medical device in the form of an application. We're at the point of care, so we know that everything we're assessing is accurate and immediate, timely. Um, we are then, of course, fully integrated across into track care and other EMRs via IRIS. And I'm going to be talking more about how we actually achieve that later in today's session. But ultimately, what you are left with is in your relevant clinical system, a pain score, the pain severity, and a complex pain profile that looks not just at the face, but at a wide variety of different metrics that you can then pull into your system and use to support your clinical decision making. Pain checks being used around the world with uh, our largest client base, as you, I'm sure you can appreciate, is in Australia and New Zealand, but growing in the, in the UK, the EU, um, in Canada. I've actually this past week been in Canada launching our first Canadian clients, which is very exciting. I'm not looking forward to the red eye on Wednesday night to go and continue that work, but very, very exciting. We're also going through the FDA process at the moment in, uh, here in the United States, which we hope to have to hope to have complete by early next year. So I've talked about what the tool is, who is using it and where, but we can also see really significant outcomes in its use. Huge reductions in things like the use of antipsychotic medication, the use of benzodiazepine and other tranquilizing medications, and a reduction in falls. If someone's in pain or heavily medicated, they are more likely to fall. So we're able to see these huge clinical outcomes alongside time saving through the leveraging of that technology in modern research. I wanna talk more about the hospital setting now, and I am getting through at a clip because we only have so much time today, but to talk about the hospital setting now. So in hospitals, there are a wide variety of reasons why someone may be unable to effectively communicate their pain. I've listed some up on screen here. I'm not gonna go through them. You're likely very familiar. But just to say that a huge proportion of people in hospitals at any given time may have difficulty communicating and therefore may require observational pain assessment. And if pain assessment is done badly, I've talked to you about the benefits, but on the opposite side of things, we know that you know, poorly managed pain, this example is in someone living with dementia in a hospital setting, you could see things like significantly longer hospital stays, significantly increased risk of delirium developing during that hospital stay, and as I've mentioned, much higher use of, medica of you know, heavy duty medications like our antipsychotics. With all of that said, I'll now actually give you a bit of an, a demonstration of the application so you can see what this all looks like in practice. And I've got one that I prepared earlier. So the first thing that's happening here, I'm signing into the pain check app, having selected my profile. From my dashboard here, because of course we're in a hospital, everyone has their wristband. So I'm going to use a barcode scanner within the application, pulling that data straight from my integrated EMR to identify my patient. I'm pulling my patient's details straight up to verify their ID, and I'm beginning my assessment process, selecting my observational pain check assessment. 
As I begin the assessment, I need to document the timing. Is that person resting or up and about? But then, as you can see, the system has defaulted to conducting a video facial analysis using our AI system to assess that individual's pain. So we're going to open up the camera now as we progress and look at that, uh, look at that patient's face. The system will then conduct a three-second analysis to identify any of those nine micro-expressions of pain that may be present. So in just three seconds, the system was able to identify, in this case, two legitimate expressions, cheek raising and parting of the lips, and it's documented those for us automatically. We're then going to flow through that multidimensional assessment, as I highlighted. We move across to talk about the person's vocalizations. And in this case, uh, we've got our patient who is making those noisy pain sounds, as we've observed, being in the room with them. Um, they're also sighing there. We swipe through again and we think about their movement. In this case, we could see that our patient was restless and of course, they were also guarding that body part. I don't know if you noticed there was a wrist brace on, so I think guarding that wrist. They've also been pacing back and forth. We then look at their behavior. In this case, we had a patient who was you know, actually quite verbally abusive. They also appeared quite confused at the time of assessment when we were interacting with them. We look at their activity now. Have they been doing any, any of, uh, anything like resisting care, for example? Not in this case. Finally, we look at the condition of their body. This one's very straightforward, looking at things like whether they are pale or flushed, if their breathing is rapid, and if they have any injuries. And in this case, we know that they do. All of these different indicators that we've responded to are binary choices. These contrast with other assessment tools you may be familiar with, uh, which ask you, you know, what is the perceived severity? What is the perceived frequency? By limiting this to a yes or no response, either fully automated by the artificial intelligence or uh, as observed by the clinician, yes or no, we know that we're able to significantly limit the, uh, the subjectivity of that assessment. So we're accurate, objective, and consistent. Of course, we're then gonna press that display summary down the button down the bottom and see the overview of our paint. Down the bottom of the screen, you can see a pain score and a pain rating, and in this case, a rating of mild pain for this mock assessment. But importantly, we also see what, was, what we scored in each of those different areas. This allows us to create that profile of the person beyond just a top-level pain score, but actually look at all the different components that contribute to that and can then flow into our broader clinical decision-making. You might notice on screen, we've got a score of 11, and that's mild pain. Most people aren't quite used to that. The pain check scale is a little bit different. It is a zero to 42 scale. It's just how the science worked out. But thanks to the automated features and automated rating, well, we don't have to worry about getting people to convert that themselves. So when we go ahead and save our assessment, you'll see it'll fly off the screen. And thanks to our integrations, our interoperability with Iris, we're able to flow directly into track care. So with track care as our example EMR today, I think for fairly obvious reasons, we can see here an example of a pain check pain chart in the system. So each of these columns on the screen represents a pain assessment. In this case, this is how we've set it up. You can see the name of the assessor. In this case, it was myself. And um, we can also see all of the details of that assessment, including the granular scores throughout those different areas, the face, the voice, et cetera. This information can then also be charted out visually. We can rapidly assess trending and changes right there within track care. But the biggest power for me is once we're within track care, we can begin tying that data into a wide variety of different things that you know, the system holds, all that clinical data. Some of the decision support tools like dynamic lists, I've got, this is a, a very small example here, but I've pulled together just a dynamic list showing us patients who might be appropriate for observational pain assessment. Maybe they have uh, difficulty communicating, which is something we document in the system, as well as potentially uh, uh, you know, a history of pain or previous pain indicators, anything that might contribute. Ultimately, what we're able to achieve is you know, producing pain as a genuine fifth vital sign, something the healthcare industry has been striving towards for you know, the last 20 plus years. Tied into all that information that we can pull from your EMR or you're tying into the information in the EMR itself, we can conceivably create things like early warning alerts for physicians, identifying if a patient is, is deteriorating or needs review. 
We can improve things like post-surgical and general pain management, you know, really limiting that risk of delirium through inappropriate, through inappropriate management of pain. Uh, and of course, generally optimizing those therapeutic treatments. So that's sort of what we do and how we do it. Uh, for the remainder of this session, I'm, I wanna quickly talk to you about how we've been able to achieve that with IRIS. And you'll forgive, you'll see an immediate change in the quality of slides as it's gone to ones that have been made personally. But it's okay, they get a little bit better. But just to say, there were four sort of key challenges in entering the hospital market that we identified. You know, healthcare is healthcare is healthcare, but it isn't. The scale, the security, and well, as you can see, the security, the technical standards, the requirements for speed and for scale are massive in hospitals in a way that they simply aren't in, you know, often in long-term care, home care, disability support, for example, other areas where we're used. So first I wanna talk about security. So PainCheck, as it was originally designed, were a multi-tenanted system hosted in the cloud, and we would generally connect directly with various EMRs, CMSs, medication management systems over HTTPS, and that's fine and it is secure, but the requirements in a hospital setting are often significantly higher. And how did we, how did we get around this? And you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear this answer time and time again through the end of this presentation. The answer was, of course, Iris for Health deployed within PainCheck's ecosystem. So deployed on, on, our, on our hardware or in our infrastructure, um, having Iris allowed us to create a highly secure, uh, highly secure access management setup so we can connect with any relevant hospital system with the standards or with the level of security that they require. It allows us to use our multi-tenanted system in a very secure way with those systems meeting those requirements. And beyond that, it allows us to implement secure versions of standards like FHIR and HL7, which although commonly used are not intrinsically secure in of themselves. Speaking of standards, um, when PainCheck was built, it was sort of custom everything. Um, and custom everything, as it turns out, does not align with the FHIR standard, with HL7, or any of the other standards floating around. So we needed a way to bridge this gap. And you guessed it, <laughs> they've made life very easy. Once again, Iris for Health. So we've been able to map all of our custom fields, all of our specific pain items into those relevant standards through Iris. And that mapping can happen in real time and setup is exceptionally straightforward. It can be done through a GUI. So uh, even people like myself, I'm product, but I'm not a developer. I was able to be directly involved in same. And of course, it works the other way around. All of the rich information sitting within that EMR becomes available to our system. So we're able to draw that in. Of course, at this stage, we're looking at things like patient records for easy and rapid identification, but the sky is the limit moving forward. I'll move on to this concept of speed. Yeah, we often say that you know, we need to operate at the speed of care. If we are not there, if the results are not there in your core system when you need them as a clinician, as, uh, you know, as a physician, as a nurse, then we're actively making your process more difficult and that is the last thing that we want in the world. Thankfully, with Iris for Health, even managing that security, managing that standard conversion into whatever standard you may need or that integrated system may need, we're able to support near real-time two-way communication, literally in the order of seconds between pressing save on your device and seeing that information populate directly in track care or vice versa. A new patient is admitted and now they're available for assessment in the pain check system. I've uh, doubled up on speed because, you know, to be honest, also incredibly easy to configure. So Iris for Health, using just the Docker image and their online documentation, we were able to have this set up within our infrastructure in a matter of hours, not days, not weeks, but hours, which I know our team was extremely pleased about. I, I did lie a little bit, I, I tripled up on speed because you know, in, <laughs> in setting up the system, um, you know, inevitably, any configuration, you're going to run into problems. But with Iris for Health, we were actually, you're actually able to watch that traffic coming back and forth, see what the bottleneck is, see what the error is, fix it, and then see that data begin flowing again. 
So uh, once again, I know our developers are extremely pleased with uh, how we were able to configure this, monitor it. And this, I've talked about setup, but it does go for monitoring ongoing. The last item I'll talk about is scalability. In our previous life, we're very used to, as I touched on earlier, connecting directly with a single system for a specific client. And we might have only a, a handful of connections into a variety of multi-tenanted systems. It's not how it works in the hospital system globally. We need to be able to speak to individual instances that are being managed by those organizations, often multiple instances being managed by those organizations. And um, if you'll forgive the graphic, um, it's absolutely something that we know that we're now finally able to achieve with Iris for Health living in our infrastructure. So not only can we connect to multiple instances of say track care, for example, for multiple clients, even for a single client, but we can connect to multiple systems operating multiple different standards if needed so that we can be flowing that clinical assessment data where it's needed to support care provision now. So um, I only had a short slot, so that is really it for me today in terms of that overview. Ultimately, our goal at PainCheck is ensuring that no one lives in pain. Even if they can't effectively communicate, we've been able to leverage that technology and that modern research to really ensure that clinicians always know what they need to know. They can treat pain, identify it, manage it early, and get the best outcomes for their patients. And we've been able to achieve that in partnership with InterSystems. So um, at this point, I'll just say a thank you to all of you. If there are any questions, please do let us know. Um, sing them out. And, uh, Otherwise, uh, yeah, very much appreciated for you, uh, yeah, for your attendance. Question on speed. Um, talk about number of hours, a short number of hours configured. Does that vary between the first time with Iris for Health versus individual hospitals in a group? Can you talk about the difference? Right on. So I think. Uh, the way that we generally need to configure it at this stage is likely to be you know, a couple of hours per hospital or per, per group of hospitals, per managed system. Um, that's just because ultimately everyone is you know, quite different at the end of the day. Though if conceivably we had multiple instances being run by the same organization, all configured in the same way, it would be you know, you know, one, effectively one setup process, just duplicate it. In terms of the, for lack of a better term, acoustic assessment that is subjective to the person who's actually doing the are they bombing by the means, any thought of making that be as automated as possible as well as saying video, you have audio capture capability usually on the in, in Indeed. Um, so the very short answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, um, the longer answer is yes, but I probably can't talk about it in too much detail. <laughs> Unless anyone else had anything else. Great. Thank you all so much. Enjoy your afternoon and evening. <laughs>